Now, and he's, he has to finish it at quarter to ten, he told me, and he will. Uh, and he is going to talk to us this morning about, uh, the theme of his talk is, an evangelical discovers the real presence. Would you please welcome Mark Shea. Good morning. Everybody having a good time? Good. I'm very, I'm very glad. I will uh, do to you what I did to your youth last night. I will tell you a joke. What's orange and sounds like a parrot? Ah! Oh! This isn't fair, all you Kiwis, you know these things. All right, I'll tell you one more. What, uh, what do Winnie the Pooh and John the Baptist and Attila the Hun have in common? They've got the same middle name. All right, okay. Try and get your blood moving. I want to talk about how an evangelical like me came to believe in the real presence in the Eucharist. As many of you probably know, this is not something that comes naturally to evangelicals. Um, but it is something I think that it's important for us to talk about uh, because it is uh, one of the happy phenomena of the last couple of decades has been that there has been an increased charity and mutual respect between Catholics and Protestants. And this is a charity and respect which the Second Vatican Council encourages us to foster. But there do remain obstacles to unity. One of them is the Catholic doctrine of the real presence which, as the Council of Trent said, means that in the nourishing sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, after the consecration of the bread and wine, our Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true, God, true man, is present under the appearance of those sensible things, or, in short, that the bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Evangelicals don't buy this. Why? Well, as an evangelical, I can tell you, it sounds like medieval superstition. But something that Catholics need to be aware of is that when you're talking to an evangelical, and there are a lot of us out there, more every year, um, you're really, in a sense, I think it's important to be aware that in a certain sense, it can be said that you're not talking to a Protestant. Why? Well, as somebody who became an evangelical at the age of 20, and many, many evangelicals are what? They are recipients of a born-again experience. In other words, many, many of us are people who come from non-Christian backgrounds and are becoming Christian. This is very much the case for me. I was not protesting anything when I became a believer. I wanted Jesus. And somebody said, here's Jesus. And I said, okay, I'll take him. I did not have Rome in my mind, okay? And that's really important for us to think about because when we think of Protestant, I mean, what's the word? Protest, right? What was the protest against? Well, we're now four centuries away from that protest. And many, many people who become Christians today are not protesting anything. Okay, so we need to keep that in mind. When I was an evangelical, I encountered then the doctrine of the real presence, not something as I, that I grew up with as a child and then rejected. I encountered it as something brand new and shocking. And that's as it should be. The doctrine of the real presence is shocking. And if you're not shocked by it, well, I think you're not awake. What are we saying when we're talking about the Eucharist? We're saying this thing that you're holding in your hand is Jesus Christ, is the God of the universe. If that's not shocking, I don't know what is. And so as an evangelical, I was properly shocked by it. And I was dubious, of course. But I began to encounter in my reading and also just in meeting people, people who it seemed to me had genuine Christian faith. And not just um, people around me, but people a long time ago who were no slouches when it came to the practice of the faith and when it came to having it up here, too. 
St. Augustine, for example, St. Thomas, St. Francis, Mother Teresa, um, G.K. Chesterton, among others, believed in the doctrine of the real presence, and they didn't seem to be aware that this was something that had obviously been disproven a long time ago. And so I started to wonder, well, what are the biblical arguments against the real presence? It seemed to me that it was unbiblical. That was what I was taught. Um, it seemed to me that there were a lot of reasons not to believe it. What were the reasons that I had, that I sort of imbibed as an evangelical, in coming to reject the real presence? And were they biblical? Here's the first reason that I immediately latched onto. It seemed to me to be an obvious reason why the real presence was not biblical. If the Eucharist really is the body and blood of Christ, we're talking about a human sacrifice, aren't we? Doesn't God forbid human sacrifice? Well, yes, but I began to think of something else. What happens if I carry this argument to its logical conclusion? Who is Jesus Christ? He is true God and true man. And he is our Passover sacrifice. That makes him a human sacrifice, doesn't it? It makes him the only permissible human sacrifice in the economy of God. Okay, well, if the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, as the church taught, then what was I saying? If I say that God always, absolutely always forbids human sacrifice, then I have to say that the crucifixion of Christ was something that God would never have allowed. And yet, of course, the crucifixion of Christ is central to our salvation. If the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, then my argument falls down. Well, I thought I saw a way around that. One other thing that I was taught, of course, was that the real presence, <coughs> excuse me, adds to the once for all sacrifice of Christ by sacrificing him again in the sacrifice of the mass. You see, one of the things that I was taught as an, as an evangelical is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. Uh, many of you may have encountered people who have told you this already. Hebrew 10, 10 says that Christ was sacrificed once for all, once. If he's sacrificed once for all, what are those Catholics doing sacrificing him over and over and over again in the sacrifice of the Mass. Hmm, this looks like a pretty clear corruption of Revelation. But then, as I began to think about it, I began to realize that the Catholic response to this lay not in some church pronouncement somewhere, but in my very own Bible. Two biblical ideas. The first we've already looked at, the humanity of Christ. The second biblical idea is the eternity of Christ. What do we mean when we're talking about the eternity of Christ? Well, as human beings, we live in time. And so we tend to think of the life of Christ as this sort of section out of a timeline of world history, 6 BC to 30 AD. This is the life of Christ. It happened way long ago. But Jesus Christ is not stuck in time as we are. Why? Because he created time. He dwells outside time. God, says scripture, is everlasting. He is the I am, the one to whom all time is present, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, who was and who is and who is to come. And so, terms like omniscient and omnipresent, although they're fun to apply to the U.S. Internal Revenue Service, really are more fittingly applied to him. But if he's truly omnipresent, if he really dwells everywhere as God, then it is equally true that he dwells every when. He surrounds time, and he enters it at his choosing. It's exactly this reality that Scripture is getting at when it tells us in Revelation chapter 13, 8, that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so, because of his eternal nature, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, which we experience at a certain point on this timeline, are a fact of his changeless being always and everywhere, before and after and beyond all worlds. Christ, being God, transcends time because he invented it. And that is biblical.
So we've got these two biblical ideas, the humanity and the eternity of Christ. And when you put these together, how does that affect us? How did that affect me as an evangelical 2,000 years down the timeline? How did we, evangelicals, who are separated from this one sacrifice by two millennia and half a world, get in touch with it? Well, the funny thing that I realized was that we evangelicals had no problem with the idea of making the sacrifice of Christ present verbally on a daily basis. We spoke, for example, of entering into the throne room of God in prayer. We spoke of claiming the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We spoke of pleading the blood in prayer. That is, of appropriating this one sacrifice of Christ to ourselves by such prayer every day. This was not seen as re-sacrifice. Rather, it was merely a participation in the one and only sacrifice there ever was. So what was it with Catholics that bothered me? It was this. It was the physical appropriation of the one sacrifice that we regarded as re-sacrifice. But is that what Catholics mean by the sacrifice of the Mass? No. For they make themselves very clear that the Eucharist is a re presentation or a making present of the one and only sacrifice of Christ on the cross. In short, just like our evangelical participation in the one sacrifice of the man Christ Jesus through verbally pleading the blood in prayer, I found Catholics participated in that same one eternal sacrifice through physically pleading the blood in sacrament. And if our evangelical pleading of the blood was not a re-sacrifice, but a present participation in that eternal reality, then neither could I find reason to say the Catholic participation in that same reality was re-sacrifice. Especially because when I looked at scripture itself, you find that the apostles use exactly the same kind of language that dominates the thought of the Council of Trent. St. Paul says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ is not the bread we share, a participation in the body of Christ. Here, too, we find in Scripture the same language of participation, not re-sacrifice, that dominates the thought of Trent. Trent, biblical, who'd have thought it? So, in the end, I came to the conclusion that if there is an argument against the real presence in the Eucharist, this is not it. But, of course, I had other objections. For example, as a friend of mine said, look, we're forbidden to drink blood under both the Old and New Covenants. You can't drink blood, says the book of Exodus. The blood is the life. You're not allowed to drink it. It belongs to God. Again, in the New Covenant, we're told in Acts 15 that um, the Council of Jerusalem uh, told, told the, uh, the churches that they could not eat blood. But as I thought about it, I'd always thought that this was a weak objection. Here's why. First of all, Jesus removed all the Old Testament dietary um, prescriptions. That means that we're free to eat anything from pork to piranhas if we want. Um, but what about the New Testament prohibition? Well, what about it? Is it a dogma? Or is it a prohibition that is put on the church in response to a particular cultural circumstance, i.e. scandalizing our Jewish neighbors? Um, St. Paul says pretty clearly that it's the latter. How do I know this? Well, in 1 Corinthians, he tells the Corinthians that they can eat food sacrificed to idols. Guess what? Food sacrificed to idols is also forbidden by that same Jerusalem council. Why does Paul go against the council? He doesn't. He's saying, look, the reason for the prohibition was don't scandalize your Jewish neighbors. If you don't have any Jewish neighbors to scandalize, there's nothing inherently wrong with eating this. So, and then Paul goes on, actually, in Romans, it says, there is no food that is unclean. No food. That means blood. But a bigger issue comes up for me. When we look at the Old Testament prohibition in Exodus, it says the blood is the life. The blood is the life. What is the meaning of this? Well, again, the idea is the, is the Jewish idea that the blood of a creature lives, that the life of a creature is in its blood. And so, when you kill an animal, you pour the blood on the ground. Why? Because you're offering it back to God. It is not yours to claim for yourself. You do not get your life from this creature. You get your life from God. 
Well, when Jesus Christ comes, what does he call himself? I am the way, the truth, and the life. What are we doing when we obey the command of Jesus to drink his blood? We are getting our life from God. We're getting our life from God. The whole point of this commandment in Exodus was to point us to the true life. Hmm, very interesting, I thought. Okay, but there was still a problem for me. The real presence, I was taught, makes the Eucharist a form of idolatry, since true worship is spiritual, not physical, isn't it? Jesus says that God is spirit, and we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. So what are we doing when we pick up this piece of bread, this physical thing, and worship it? Isn't this idolatry? That seemed to me to be a very powerful objection until I thought again about what happens if I take that objection to its logical conclusion. If it is always idolatry, I realize, to say that the Spirit of God is manifested physically, what was I supposed to do with St. Thomas when he bows before the carbon-based, DNA-filled body of Jesus of Nazareth, who is fully human, and worships him as my Lord and my God. As with human sacrifice, as with the prohibition against blood, I realize that such things are sinful only if the object of worship is not Jesus Christ. But if the Eucharist, so if the Eucharist is just bread and wine, then of course it's idolatrous to worship it. It's just bread. But if, as Catholics say, the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, then it is a sin not to worship it. Blink, blink. Wow. And I had still not shown that the Eucharist is only bread and wine. I had merely assumed it. So was there disproof? Well, my evangelical tradition said, look, <laughs> we're saved by grace, not by works, pal. The real presence makes the Eucharist a form of salvation by works. Why? Because it's a means of grace, said Catholic teaching. You go to this and you receive grace from going through this ritual. Well, rituals. I don't really know about rituals. I'm an evangelical. We don't go for this kind of stuff. Rituals. Sounds like, you know, jump through this ritualistic hoop and you get some brownie points from God. I don't know. You're supposed to claim things by faith, aren't you? Well, I thought about this for a while. And ironically, what it was, was it was a sermon given by my evangelical pastor, who of course did not believe in the real presence of all, at all, who really began to show me the way out of this conundrum. He was talking about John 6. And he said um, that, of course, you know, the passage in John 6 where Jesus tells us to eat his flesh and drink his blood wasn't really referring to his uh, flesh and blood, of course. It was referring to his teaching. That's what it meant. And that if we are to grow in the Lord, he said, we must eat his word. We have to read scripture every day because it's food for maturity. It has nothing to do with communion at all, he said. Well, oddly enough, this really struck me from an unusual angle because I'd been thinking about all this stuff about means of grace. And it began to dawn on me that scripture reading as food for maturity was remarkably similar to Catholic teaching in an odd way. I saw it once in a kind of a flash that the ritual of regular Bible reading and the ritual of regular communion were both means of grace. The only difference is that in the former case, God transubstantiates paper and ink and the human voice into his word, whereas in the latter, he changes the bread and wine into something even more impressive, according to Catholics. So my difficulty, again, I realized, was not with the idea of means of grace per se, it was the, with the idea of nonverbal means of grace. Yet when I looked at scripture, I found God working in and through not only words, but tempests, hands, armies, uh, shepherd staffs, whirlwinds, muddy rivers, handkerchiefs, and of course, even, <laughs> even the hands and even the saliva of our Lord himself. Why? Because the word is made flesh. The word is not just made word. Wow. And so I was down now to my last objection that I could think of. And it was simply, look, the Eucharist is just a symbol. 
At which point the church said, it's a symbol. It's not just a symbol. And that's what you have to prove, Mark. You have to prove that it's just a symbol. And you haven't done so. And when I thought, thought about that, I began to realize that as those objections fell away one by one, what's left standing? The doctrine of the real presence it was, as it was believed by the whole church until about 400 years ago. So I thought, I better look at scripture again. And so I said, well, let's play pretend for a minute. What if the church, what if the Bible is read as a Catholic document? How will it look? And by golly, as I started looking at it again, I began to realize that this really does begin to look very Catholic. Consider, for starters, the plain meaning of Christ's own words. Um, as we've seen, my own tradition taught that the bread of life discourse in John 6 is a sort of extended parable. But as I examined this passage, what struck me was that Jesus nowhere hints that he is speaking in a parable when he tells the crowd at Capernaum, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. It does not say this bread is my teaching. Well, was he speaking in a parable? St. Mark says that when Jesus spoke in parables, he always explained his parables to his disciples privately. You know what he does here? Most of his disciples left him at this point, saying, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And what Jesus does not do is run after them saying, wait, fellas, I was just using a metaphor. He doesn't do that. He turns to his disciples and says, well, you gonna leave me too? No explanation of a parable. Hmm. Then he does something else interesting. Very interesting. Later on in the gospel, he tells the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man is going to be handed over to sinful men and he's going to be beaten up and killed and on the third day rise again. And you know what? The disciples did what I was trying to do with the Bread of Life discourse. They wink at it and they turn their heads sideways and they say, well, <clears throat> there must be some deeper meaning here. And you know what? There was no deeper meaning here. He will die and rise, period. He wasn't using a parable. In the same way, it began to appear very much as, he was, as though he was saying, this bread is my flesh, period. This is compounded by the fact that Jesus indulges in identical language at the Last Supper. He identifies himself with the Passover. He takes bread and wine and declares them to be his body and blood, period. No explanation, no deeper meaning. The only reference point he gives his disciples is their own Jewish heritage of the Passover sacrifice and their memory of his words of, in the Bread of Life discourse. Now, what they made of this at the time, who knows? I mean, you know, if this were thrust upon you out of the blue, what would you make of it? But when the events of the next three days in the light of the Holy Spirit made clear just how baldly factual Christ could be concerning his death and resurrection, ought we to be surprised if they took Jesus' words about the Eucharist literally as well? No, especially because there isn't a particle of evidence that they did understand him in any other way. And so Paul, clearly echoing tradition he has received from the Twelve, declares the Eucharist, as we have seen, a participation in the body and blood of Christ, just like Catholic theology does. He even says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23, that we can eat unworthily, we can receive unworthily the Eucharist and thereby sin against the body and blood of Christ. It's hard to sin against a piece of bread. And as well, when we begin to look at the immediate successors of the apostles, men who in some cases heard them with their own ears, we find that they say the same things. Ignatius of Antioch, for instance, says that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He heard the Apostle John. Clement of Rome calls the Mass a sacrifice. Justin Martyr says, we have been taught that the food which has been Eucharized, 
by the word of prayer from him is the flesh and blood of the incarnate Jesus. Irenaeus, whose teacher was Polycarp, who himself was a hearer of the Apostle John, and who, by the way, is not given to inventing new things, says that the bread which is produced from the earth when it receives the invocation of God is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two realities, earthly and heavenly. And so it goes down through the entire patristic era. Now, are you going to find fathers who speak of the Eucharist as a symbol? You bet. But they never say that it's only a symbol. You can always, many times you can find one father saying it's a symbol, and then in the next breath he'll be saying, and it's the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Very Catholic. And so, given my utter failure to disprove the Eucharist, I began to think, wow, this really looks biblical. In fact, as I began to look into the matter, you know what I discovered? The first person to say, look, the Eucharist is only a symbol, comes a thousand years after the apostles. A thousand years later. And the whole church looks at him and says, what? You can't say that. We've never believed that. This idea percolates around, but it isn't really until the Reformation that it finally begins to gain currency. And I was, as an evangelical, through a long and complicated process, an inheritor of that incredibly newfangled idea that I thought was so obvious. Well, when I realized that, I realized Eucharist is not an option. This is the teaching of Scripture, and I, therefore, am commanded, as Jesus says, to eat this bread. Take, eat, this is my body. Okay, I thought, where do I go to do that? <laughs> How do I do that? Um, is this something that I can do for myself? Hey, I was new at this. <laughs> can I consecrate the Eucharist for myself? No, said all the fathers of the early church. You can't do that. Why can't I do that? Because it was only to the apostles that this command was given. And it is only to their duly designated successors that the power to consecrate the Eucharist is given. Not just any Joe Schmo can consecrate the Eucharist, only ordained Schmoes. <laughs> and I thought, okay. That means I have to start thinking about apostolic succession. Some of that I talked about yesterday. Um, but when I began to look at the evidence for apostolic succession, it's there in the New Testament, it is there all along through the history of the church. Um, it's assumed. And it is by apostolic authority, given by Jesus Christ, that the power to consecrate the Eucharist is given. And when I realized that, I realized it was time to become a Catholic. And so, I want to close with a couple of points. First of all, one of the things that I want to point out that as this talk has gone along is that I owe a debt to everybody. I owe a debt to my Protestant brothers and sisters, first of all. Why? Because they taught me to read the Bible. And if they hadn't taught me to read the Bible, I wouldn't have found this stuff out. They taught me who Jesus Christ was first. They taught me how to pray. They taught me how to have faith in him. And so I am a debtor to them. I owe them a debt that I'll never be able to repay. Second, I'm here to say thank you to those Protestants then. I want to say that the, the good things that I have uh, from the Lord are things that you gave me first, that, the, that my Protestant brothers and sisters gave me first. And our Catholic faith teaches us that grace builds on nature. And so, as, um, for example, um, Scott Hahn would say, uh, I regard myself not as an ex-evangelical, but as a completed evangelical. And that's why I want to thank also my Catholic brothers and sisters. And I, w I hope that if anything could come out of something like this, that both Catholics and Protestants would gain a renewed appreciation of one another. Because it is Catholics, ultimately, who here have so faithfully adored our Lord in the Eucharist, that I want to thank for carrying on that work of worship. It is a work which you 
both clergy and lay are called in grace to assist, and which because of your faithfulness has brought another human being to the table of the Lord, and not just me. Because ultimately, it is going to be each and every person, as our Holy Father says, that this call and this work is to embrace. It is each and every person from every nation and language and tribe and tongue who is called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So carry on the work of worship then, because you are already bearing fruit in the Holy Spirit. And this fruit, as our Lord says, will last. Thank you.